Okay, it is Wednesday afternoon, April 12th. Welcome back. We did not have class last week, so if you're looking on video, we did not miss April 5th. We were involved with our satyrs. Praise the Lord be his glory. But we are now back in our journey through the book of Bereshit of Genesis. We have just come through a very hard chapter. It was a chapter that told the story of Saddam and Gomorrah, Saddam and Amorah in my Hebrew, and uh, Lot's losing everything, including his wife, because she her heart was, was with the evil and not with the Lord. And uh, um, it just, the whole Fertile Valley has changed now. It's desolate out of the judgment that the fire and brimstone that fell from heaven. We have Lot finally go to where God wanted him to go into the mountainous areas. This was the mountains of Moab or Moab. You'll hear about them later in scripture. We know probably the most famous that comes to mind quickly is Ruth from the book of Ruth that uh, she was a Moabitess, she came from that area. How did the Moabite people begin? Well, Lot and his two daughters were alone in the mountains. The daughters think this is it. There's nobody left in the world. We want family, we want our name to go on, we want someone to take care of us, and, and not having the um, laws that we have established, they, it was not looked upon in their mind as a horrible to have relations with their father. They thought it was acceptable. They both did. They both got pregnant. Um, the Moabite people come from one of them and the Ammonites that you'll hear about in scripture also in Chronicles and in Kings. Um, one of Solomon's wives, um, I think it was the mother of King Rehoboam, if I remember right, was an Ammonite. Anyway, they in time become the enemies of Israel. But in their inception as a group of people, they were not enemies. And in fact, it's very interesting. I do have it down. Let, let's back up to that point and then we'll go right into 20. Naamah is the name of the Ammonite woman that was one of Solomon's wives and the mother of King Rehoboam. Look with me real quick in 2 Chronicles 12 and verse 13. And if you don't want to turn, I will be reading these. Uh, scriptures to you uh, because you we are going to be in Genesis so if you want to just stay there you can uh, but 2nd Chronicles chapter 12 um, gives us in verse 13 so King Rehoboam strengthened himself in Jerusalem and reigned now this is when the, the it, Israel is the divided kingdom now Solomon is, is past now and it's gone down to his sons, and, and there's division. So you're going to have your 10 northern tribes and your two southern tribes. Rehoboam is here, and he is, is on the throne in Jerusalem. And uh, it says when he was 41 years old, he began to reign. He reigned 17 years in Jerusalem, the city which the Lord had chosen from all the tribes of Israel to put his name there. <laughs> if it gets too warm, you can open the door for me. Uh, 2 Chronicles 12, verse 13, okay, tells us about the Ammonite woman who gave, um, was Solomon's wife and was the mother of King Rehoboam, one of Solomon's sons. Then look at 1 Kings 14, 22. That's very close to Chronicles, just back up a little bit. 1 Kings 14, <clears throat> 1 Kings 14 and verse 20, 24, almost the 22, sorry, it's 24. And there we read, there was also male cult. No, nope, I've got the wrong verse. I have the wrong verse. I must have the wrong chapter. 14, 1 Kings 14, 24. 1 Kings 14, 24. Oh, okay, okay. This isn't showing the relation, but this is showing how they became, you know, I told you there starts from Lot's daughters. But here there were also male cult prostitutes in the land. They did according to all the abominations of the nations which the Lord dispossessed before the sons of Israel. So they were kicked out of the land because of their abominations, their idolatry, and, and all that went along with their idolatry. But what's interesting, the Ammonite one, we see that that, that comes with, um, or I'm sorry, that was the Moabite line. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Anyway, my point is they started out 
Later they became so full of idolatry and abominations that God said, I'll clear them out of Israel and give the line of Israel to the Jewish people, okay? Now, they were in that ancestral line, uh, both the Ammonites and the Moabites to Yeshua. Go with me real quickly to Matthew 1, and I'll show you that there. I love our Jewish genealogy in our first book in the Bria Chadashah, our New Covenant. In Matthew chapter 1, we start right away saying it's the genealogy of Yeshua HaMashiach, the son of David, David, the son of Abraham, Abraham. And it goes on. Verse 7 tells us Solomon was the father of Rehoboam. Rehoboam was the father of Abba, 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 between my Hebrew and my English, sorry. Abijah, say it in English, and Abijah, the father of Asa. So there's you've got Solomon and you've got Rehoboam. Rehoboam was the the, the result of Solomon's relationship with a with the Ammonite Naamah. So you've got the Ammonite in the line, the ancestral line to Yeshua Jesus. In other words, it's not just a the just the Jewish line. It was it was predominantly so that he's of Jewish descent. But you see where others came in, they became proselytes into Judaism. They became part of the Commonwealth of Israel. Ruth was a Moabitess. The Moabites were cut off from being a part of Israel for 10 generations. Ruth was the very next generation. She's also in this line in verse five, it says that Salmon was the father of Boaz by Rahab, Rahab was a harlot. We know that story from Jericho. Boaz was the father of Obed by Ruth. Obed was the father of Jesse. Jesse's the father of David, and it keeps going on down. So we see in the Lord's lineage, we have a Moabite who was brought in. We have an Ammonite who was brought in. God does not wipe out those who will have a heart for him. He brings them out. Yes, Okay, is, is this the same person that uh, Solomon, no, it was Solomon. That was Solomon's wife's, yeah. Solomon had a wife. I'm sorry? Is that the same that touched here? No, oh, no, same. you're thinking Samson. You're, okay. Yeah, Solomon was the wise. He started out very wise, but he brought in concubines and wives to the count of a thousand, and them. all the idolatry came in with them. Okay, my second question is, who named the Moabites Moabites? Well, they were named that because they're coming from the territory of the mountains of Moab. So that's how, like, we're Americans because we're in America. So that's how they got named that. Can I ask you, how did uh, Lot's daughters of one man, they both be two nations? I don't understand. That. Because one named the, the son, was in the son named Moab? Yeah, so one named the son Moab which means from the father, Moab in our Hebrew. It means from the father. And so the same way that um, the Israelites got called Israelites because of Israel, they were named Israelites. Well, this was Moab, and Moab's descendants just became known as Moabites because it came from Moab. So that's how the name developed. The other daughter named her son ben -Ami, son of my people. And as time moves on, those people became known probably because they lived in the area called Ammon, they became known as Ammonites. So it, it's even though they were sisters and they both had sons, they lived in different areas and the names came from the territories they were living in. And then they become a people as we go on down through the study of time. So where did they go from the mountain? Where did they go to live? They, were, they, they, were, they still live in those areas. When you look on the map, you see if you've got Israel like this, you've got Sea of Galilee, and you, you've got, you're moving down toward the Dead Sea. On the right side of that, you'll see the, air, the area called Moab, and below that, you'll see an area where Ammon was. And those are still known territories of today that that's where these people came from. We know the Philistines were a sea people, the Phoenicians, I'm sorry, the sea people. You know, we, we begin to know different things about people, and often it's the geographical area that gives them their identity. So it's just the same here also. But they become known as a people. They become known, 
I, I'm not going to call them a tribe, but the, you know, we've got our 12 tribes that they became known, they were at the tribe of so-and-so and the tribe of so-and-so. That let us know where they were living and all kinds of things from that. And these people, even though at first they were not enemies of Israel, they took on the uh, idolatry, they took on not helping Israel, the, the, through the fences that they did, God said he would cut them off, but will they be revived and that's why i brought them up for us to look at them real quickly because now look with me at jeremiah the prophet jeremiah as we're going back to genesis jeremiah chapter 48 and verse 47 jeremiah and my hebrew chapter 48 and verse 47 and we find something very interesting it's god speaking through the prophet jeremiah and we know he called them out. He let them know they were headed for trouble. They didn't listen. They didn't like him. They threw him in the pit. They treated him wrongly, but he continued to speak for the Lord. In verse 47, God speaking through him said, Yet I will restore the fortunes of Moab in the latter days, declares the Lord. Now, we know the latter days refers to end time events. I think that this is taking it all the way to the millennial time, and I'm going to say I think in the millennium we're going to know the area of Moab, Moab and see them blessed by the Lord because he's saying he's going to restore their fortunes. So even though they as a people have gone into a judgment and have been exiled and, and we don't know who a Moabite is today, God knows and he's going to bring it back. And the same with Ammon. Go to chapter 49 and verse 6. Just one chapter over, so you can probably get there faster than my tablet. 49 and verse 6, but afterward, I will restore the fortunes of the sons of Ammon, declares the Lord. And if you read above verse 6, the afterward, you will see very quickly, it's talking about end times. So after the end times, after I believe the battle of Armageddon, when God is restoring, you're going to know a people called the Ammonites and the people called the Moabites, and they're going to be blessed by the Lord. So it's just very interesting. In the King James Version, the older version that a lot of people don't read today, it says, I will bring again. And the idea is that he, what has ceased, he will bring back. So just very interesting, but encouraging for us. God is fair and God is just. And God will bring judgment on, but then we can see his mercy also. Now there are times, they're still alive or way back there to steal. I, I believe there are. We just don't know who they are. <laughs> Any more than our Jewish people know today, with the exception of someone called Levi or Cohen, they really don't know what tribe they're from. They can say, oh, yes, I know, I know, I know. But you ask them, let's bring out the records and prove me. And they cannot because any records that were had were destroyed at 70 AD when the temple was destroyed. That's another reason why Messiah had to come before 70 AD, because he had to be able to prove that he was the line to be Messiah. And no one can prove that today. So anybody can say anything. And I've heard it, believe me. I've heard people tell me, oh, I know, we're the tribe of, it's been passed down in our family. Well, have you ever played that gossip game? <laughs> has it come down purely through your family or has it come down with, I hope, I wish, and then the next generation said, oh, we are, you know, I mean, who knows? My dad used to like to say that the, um, he, I, I, he had a lean toward wanting to be a tribe of Benjamin, Benjamin, because that's Paul, you know, and so he had that interest, but my mom popped up and said, well, you're my Boaz, you've got to be from the tribe of Judah. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, don't know. My dad and mom know now which tribe, <laughs> but yeah. I don't. I still have the question. Yeah. Um, but yeah. God does know, and God amazes yeah. me. Well, we did ask, you know, but we don't know. Our family didn't know. It wasn't, you know, well, there's and, no there, and there's no way to prove it. The reason why a Levi or a Cohen knows is because Levi comes from the Levi tribe. If, you know, the name is there. And Cohen means priest, and the Levi tribe is the priestly tribe. So if you have that name, you're most likely from that tribe. And then um, DNA has been able to identify a chromosome that belongs to that tribe. Makes me wonder. Total um, speculation. Please hear that. I'm not giving you word of God, okay? Total speculation. 
but we know in the tribulation time there are 12,000 out of each of the 12 tribes. That's why I say my God is amazing. We've mixed, we did our married, we've come down through the time, we have no idea what tribe we're from, but God has kept it where he knows and can identify out of each of the tribes. And, you know, whether that means they're 100% or whether they're a majority of that tribe, I don't know. But God, believe me, he's got the books. If DNA has come so far as to be able to identify that chromosome that, that puts them into that Levitical line, I wonder if with advances of DNA, they're going to be able to break through to some more of those tribes. And people will know what tribe they're from out of DNA testing. But the thing is, uh, just curious whether they know or not doesn't matter. God knows. Uh, Locke's daughters, uh, who did they marry? They did married they, the father, in essence. They, they didn't have a wedding ceremony, but they had babies by their father. Did they ever get married? Uh, we don't read anything of it. We don't know. We just know that their sons were Moab, who started the Moabite line, and Ben Ami, who started the uh, Ammon line, Ammonite line. Yeah. One man, he had two tribes. Wow. Yeah. Well, and look at out of Esau came ten. Uh, Ishmael, out of sorry, Ishmael. I go back further. Came ten nations out of Yaakov, twelve tribes. You know, God's amazing what He does, and it's amazing that He keeps those right. lines. He yeah, keeps. doesn't just keep track, but keeps those lines. You know, yeah. and that's why there have been a few small cases here in, in our little corner of the world with DNA testing with a couple of our people who met through, you know, Emmanuel Israel found out they were cousins and I'm looking at one of them who's a cousin to, to the pastor. Yeah. And it's like, how did that happen? <laughs> our God's amazing. But anyway, not to, to waste more time on that point. The sad thing also is as we end with uh, chapter 19 and get ready for chapter 20 is this is the last we're going to hear about Lot. We never hear about him again. Not even his death is recorded. He's of no further importance to the history of salvation or to his relationship with Abraham. So he just goes off into the dust, you know, the, the um, what do they call it, the death bowl of history, I think they call it, you know, where it's just. That's really sad. It is sad. It's a very sad commentary. You know, what a, what a sad ending. Remember, he had been under his uncle Abraham. He could have been so, you know, he was brought up to know the righteousness of the Lord and to following the Lord. And he tried to compromise with the world, maybe to reach the world. Maybe his intent was initially good. But we see the compromise didn't work. We don't see him reach anyone. And he even lost his wife. And then look at the condition of his daughters. Remember, they were probably engaged. And the sons-in-laws would not come, would not leave when the judgment was going to fall and they were warned. So that also probably left them feeling like, wow, you know, we lost our, our what we would call today fiancés, they would call our betrothed, their husbands. And the only one left is our dad. And we're going to, you know, we've got to make sure we go on. We've got, you know, and we want family. So they did what they did, they took it into their own hands. But look what comes out of them. Two nations that end up for a good majority of time being at enmity with God and God allowing them to go off into the dust bowl of history also. But he promises in some way to bring them back. So uh, just interesting the way history is, the way it records, and our Bible is history. If you don't think you like history, you're studying history when you study the Word of God because it is the study of man through time, but it's the study of Yeshua and everything in relationship to Jesus, and that's what matters. So as Lot is not in effect now to helping us in that picture to understand our salvation or to see the hand of God at work in and through that line that comes down to Messiah, we just see him basically disappear. Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry. <clears throat> so... With that in mind, we're going to start with chapter 20, and actually it's another sad chapter. We're going to see our man of faith, Abraham, who's been a great example and who did try to teach even his offspring. We're going to see the human side of him again. Yes? I don't have any more rentals. What's your last page? And I didn't bring them down. <laughs> Okay, I think I've sent out 
So I probably have upstairs, I don't know how I'm just giving it to you, but I'll try to repeat and repeat on my script references today, um, since you don't have it in front of you. Uh, those of you in um, the Zoom room, in your emails, should have had them. I didn't send anything out this last week, but I think that in my mind, I think I'm at least page 51, if not page 52. I know that you are nipping at my feet where I'm at. I'm hoping to get ahead of you. Rowena is saying yes, so I will go back upstairs. I always bring it down, but I was in a hurry today and I said I don't need to. I knew that was a mistake when I said it to myself. Um, but again, I'll try to make sure I get them clearly and I can fill in any blanks afterward also. So let's start with chapter 20. And we see that we're back talking about Abraham. Now Abraham journeyed from there toward the land of the Negev. Because we broke for two weeks, let me remind you where there is that he was on like a, a, a um, up in the hill, looking down over the valley where Sodom and Amorah were, and he seen how they've been desecrated. Remember, well, let's just go back. The Bible says it's so much better than Rochelle. And why did I get a commercial that I cannot? There we go. There we go. Okay. So at the very end of chapter 19, we're going to look at verse, um, where is it? Okay. Um, 27? Yes, thank you. Verse 27. Now Abraham got up early in the morning, went to the place where he had stood before the Lord. Remember, the Lord came to him. Came, there were three that came that we saw was a picture of the Lord. And the Lord said he was going to let Abraham know what he was going to do so Abraham would understand the judgment that was coming was from the righteous hand of God and not a mean God just lashing out and somebody you don't know what he's going to do, smile one day and hit you the next day. No, God was letting him know, this is what I'm going to do. This is why I'm going to do it. And Abraham pleads, you know, won't you bring, you know, won't you spare them if there's 50 righteous gets down to 10 righteous, there's not even 10. But God did say yes, and he did look upon Lot as righteous. That's how our standing in God, because we're forgiven past, present, future. Not that it gives us a license to go sin, but thankfully, the grace of God. It isn't that at the moment that we pass away, that if we've got an unconfessed sin, that we're locked out of heaven. That would be a horrible, horrible way to live. And there are those who do live that way, who are so afraid of losing their salvation that they're constantly, you know, up and down and in turmoil. But I know that my God's peace is the gift of salvation, gives us that peace. We are secure because he did all the work. It's not us. We didn't merit it. We can't unmerit it. Yes, you can break your fellowship. Yes, you can break your relationship. Yes, you can be taken out to the woodshed and suffer the consequences, <laughs> but you're still God's kid. The same way that when you disobeyed your parents, you didn't suddenly become an orphan. You still were your parents' child, but you needed that correction. So nobody wants that correction from the hand of God. It's fair and it's just, but it's real and it's true and it hurts. And, and if you're wise, you stay in line. So anyway, um, and I'm, I've sidetracked myself. So the judgment, God was telling Abraham the judgment was going to come. Now Abraham's gotten up in the morning. He's standing where the Lord was with him. He's looking down towards Sodom. That's what I'm trying to say, where his position was, was higher. And remember, we even saw the picture of the, of the rapture, God taking the believers out before the judgment fell. And Abraham seeing this in a view from heaven down to the judgment on earth. And uh, he looks and he sees Saddam and Amara and he sees all the surrounding area. He sees the smoke of the land ascending like the smoke of a furnace. So it's like a huge furnace going up. It's just all utter destruction. It had to sicken Abraham to know, to know that, that you know, this was devastation. People died there. Yes, it was judgment, but it had to have been grievous to him. And I bring that out to you because we are going to see a change here. In chapter 20 now, he's journeying away from the area. He's going from there toward the land of Negev. The Negev is further south. So he's, he's moving on down south. If you're looking at the map of Israel, he's moving down toward the Egyptian border. Um, he doesn't go as far as Egypt, but um, we, had, we had a time when he did. He made a major mistake down there. Anyone remember that story? 
If not, we're going to review it in a different way, but we're going to review it here very shortly. So he went down the land of the Negev, south of, of the land we call Israel today, in Israel, but south. And he settled between Kadesh and Shur. He lived for a time in Gerar. Okay, so when we have him in Gerar, let me tell you that that was the capital city at the time of the land of the Philistines. It was near the Egyptian border, but archaeology tells us it was higher than the Egyptian border. Um, it was a prosperous city. It controlled a lucrative caravan route, and caravans were the trade routes. So if you were on that trade route, you had all kinds of, you know, you could have spices from another country that's been brought to you, and you would trade what value you had in your land. So you wanted to live on the caravan routes if you wanted a, a life of luxuries and, and blessings. There was also robbers, too, on that line, too. I'm sure there was, you know, they marauders and all. Sure, sure, there would be, yeah. Our history tells us that. Um, those of you who know where Gaza is, it was 8 to 12 miles southeast of Gaza. So Gaza's on the border, down low on the map of Israel today, you've got the Mediterranean Sea. When you're looking at the map, the Mediterranean Sea is on the left. So we're talking go down past Gaza and go east toward Jordan, and that's the area we're talking about. It's 50 miles south of Hebron, we call it Hebron. <coughs> That's north of Beersheba. So with all of that, if you look at a map today or back in the past, you'll see we're talking above Egypt, but we're headed down toward Egypt. Now, why did Abraham leave where he was? Why did he leave that area? Lots disgrace, lots heartache, the unpleasantness now of the surroundings. That could easily be that he didn't want to be reminded every day of what his uh, nephew went through the loss of family, you know, it could have been just too grievous to Abraham to look in the sea and be reminded of God's judgment. I'm reminded of the time that the old fire came through our area and many homes were lost. <laughs> yeah, my brother's home stood, but they did admit that for quite some time they felt that, like they were living in a war zone. They were living in, you know, it was Pressing to look out around and see the remnants of burnt homes that were friends or neighbors. As I would drive over to see them, I'd go through blocks that way. And yes, it, it was it was depressing. You know, you, you had to not focus on that. And thankfully, people did rebuild and, and uh, so forth. But I can begin to say, yes, did Abraham want to look over that devastation all the time? Did he want to be constantly reminded? Maybe it's what made him say, because he was nomadic in his lifestyle. It's time to move the herds. Let's go find another place to feed the sheep and goats. You know? He might have also had some kind of business dealings in mind, because remember, he's very wealthy. And with the caravan routes, there's going to be opportunity for business. So he might have, in his wealth and his power like a chieftain, he might have been looking for a better area now. Because remember, there was also trading that was going on in Sodom and Amorah. That we talked about how they came into the gate, you know, to do business in the city. So it could be he was looking for that. He might have been seeking better pasture. But the key that I'm going to say that I believe we see because of what happens is I believe that Abraham, for a time, gets his eyes off of the Lord. This is very easy for us to do. We need to learn a lesson from Abraham. But I think that we have to say that's what happened because of what happens. If you've read ahead, you know what I'm saying. If you haven't, let me prove my point. We'll go to verse 2. Did I tell you everything I wanted in verse 1? I think I did. Um, yeah, when it says that if you've got words like settled and sojourn, job, sojourn, boy, I'm having trouble today. That does mean he lived there, he was settling there. So it wasn't that he said, let's go visit. Yeah, Dave went to Tennessee for two weeks and came home. Abraham didn't say, let's go visit and we'll come back home. He picked up his, his, his tent and his sheep and his goats and his his servants and his family, and, and he's moving them all down south, okay? So this is a, a movement. All right, so what happens? Abraham, verse 2, said of his wife, Sarah. Oops, I'm sorry, I skipped the line in there. I must have. No, I didn't. It's okay. chapter, chapter 20 and verse 2. I've read ahead, so I thought it was supposed to be. It's coming in the next sentence. 
verse 2 of chapter 20, and Abraham said of his wife, Sarah, she is my sister. Now, isn't this familiar? Haven't we heard this before? Didn't Abraham get into trouble doing this once before? You know, Sarah went into the harem of uh, one who could have had relations with her, but God didn't let it happen. So here we go again, because he's saying she's my sister. So Abimelech, Abimelech, king of Gerar, remember kings like the mayor, it's like the head of the, the whole, you know, territory. He sent men and he took Sarah. Now, remember, she's almost 90, but she was beautiful. She was very attractive. Remember, that's why Abraham said to Sarah, tell them you're my sister, because if they know you're my wife, they'll kill me to get you. He had a trophy, and he knew it. And he put her into a predicament again. Say, you're my sister. Exactly. If you didn't hear Doris, she said, for the second time, he didn't learn from the first time? Apparently not, because here we go again. And here is Abimelech, and he sees her, and apparently she was very attracted to him. So we find out he sent his men, and they took Sarah off. Uh oh, here we go. Verse 3, but God, and I love that in Scripture, but God. <laughs> God came to Abimelech in a dream of the night and said to him, Behold, it got Abimelech's attention. You are a dead man because of the woman you have taken, for she is Mary. Well, I think that behold, Loretta was waking them up. Yeah. <laughs> Hear this. Don't sleep through this. Hear this. You're a dead man. Okay. Oh. By the way, Abimelech is a standard name. It is a royal title name. The Philistine kings were all called Abimelechs. You'll see Pharaoh in Egypt. Uh, it is called Abimelech. Um, in Genesis 26 and verse 1, we can peek there real quick because we're close. We're, we're, we're at chapter 20. So just go to chapter 26 real quick. Verse 1, you're going to see the title there. There was a famine in the land besides the previous famine that occurred in the days of Abraham. So we know it's not the same time. Isaac, Yitzhak, his son, went to Gerar. So Abraham's in Gerar in chapter 20. Isaac's in Gerar in chapter 21. And notice that he, we read, so Isaac went to Gerar to Abimelech, king of the Philistines. Well, if you just read surface, you're going to think it's the same king. But if I tell you it's 80 to 100 years later when this happens, wow. yeah, all of a sudden the mouths are dropping open here. We're going, oh, no, this is not the same king. You know, this would be someone else. Um, so we see it as more of a title. Pharaoh was a title. It wasn't his first name. It was a title. Abimelech wasn't his first name. It was a title. And it was considered royalty. So even though I said he's like the mayor, we'll call him a king mayor, okay? You know, it's just that there could be many kings. It wasn't like England where there's only one. There, there could be many and many territories. So back to chapter 20. Back to Abimelech. Whoops, I've got the wrong chapter now. I've got to get back to chapter 20. Uh, we have the fact that he's being told in this dream that he's a dead man. He's got a problem on his hands. <laughs> Uh, what we see is that Abraham is acted out of fear. Look at verses 11 and 12 in chapter 20, right where we are. And Abraham's talking, and he says, Because I thought, surely there's no fear of God in this place. They will kill me because of my wife. Besides, she actually is my sister, the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother, and she became my wife. So he's justifying what he's done, but he's saying, I was afraid. They wouldn't have fear of God here, so they would respect me, so they would kill me and take Sarah. So we know that the reason why he said, say you're my sister, was out of fear. Now remember, he's our man of God, who's righteous before God, who's been walking with God, what we're seeing is the very human side of Abraham. And I will caution all of us. We can have a great walk with the Lord, but how many of you know how easy it is to have fear? Jump in. <laughs> you don't, you have to raise your hands, but we're all relating. <laughs> and in that fear, if we don't take it to the Lord and be stabilized in the Lord, trust in the Lord, follow him, we can make a mistake also. And Abraham, as giant as he was in my eyes spiritually, he was human and he made a 
boo boo. Okay, big boo boo. Big big boo boo. He he stepped in it. All right. Bigger, 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 right? Yeah, we're gonna see just how bad this is. Okay, so Abimelech has taken her. He probably saw Sarah as a political marriage because they did that in those days. And Abraham was a chieftain. He had all this, you know, wealth and this influence, and he's he's settling in the area close. You know, he's part of Gerard now. So easily, it could have been Avi Melek's way of saying, hey, you know, let's shake hands together. You know, if I've got your, your sister in my harem, you're not going to come against my house because you care about your sister. So he probably had done that out of that motive. Um, and out of the fact she was beautiful. And he had an eye for a pretty lady, you know. But uh, many, many of the harems in those days were filled with political marriages. Many of Solomon's marriages were for political reasons, you know, to make those allies out of your, who could be your enemies and your threats. But again, it's the same sin that we saw in chapter 12 when he went down into Egypt. And both times, interestingly enough, it was after a very gracious promise from God. God promising he'd make the nation out of Abraham, God promising again. And right after those promises, we see this failure. Why do I bring that out? Because number one, we can't live on yesterday's experiences. If you think I'm in a good place with God yesterday, so I'm okay today, that's your slipping right there. We have to daily be plugging into the Lord, daily be clinging to the Lord, daily be seeking from the Lord, daily be letting him guide us. And I'm going to say it moment by moment, not even just pray in the morning and close your day off with prayer, but all through the day. That's the one thing I'll say, take a lesson from Tevye and Fiddler on the Roof. He talked to God all day long about everything that was happening in his life. And that part he got right. Here's where we see, again, that Abraham had had great communion, um, companionship, fellowship, but it didn't keep him from the ability to stumble. And we cannot, pride will go before a fall, we can't think I'm safe, I've got it, I've made it, because that's a sure step to our failure also. Um, it just, it, I'm telling you, fresh, constant, daily, and realizing our humanity, our fallibility, our our, our humanness, okay? We've just, we've got to be aware of it. And often I've seen too in, in not just my life, I can look at Eliyahu Elijah in the scripture, great victory in the Lord, and the next day he can't handle anything. That's very typical. We are worn physically. We, you know, it doesn't mean that, that we've slipped away from the Lord, but Satan knows when to attack and how to attack. And he'll come at you when you are worn out. And very often, after a great victory in the Lord, you are full of the Lord. You're full of his praises. You're full of his glory. I can even attest that what I talked about earlier in my past week. I knew I was floating on waves of grace and his strength. And I will admit, a battle came. And a fierce battle came. We need to, to not try to live on yesterday we need to be fresh with the lord continually um, and the conduct of abraham i'll call him out to some degree and not that i have any right to to judge him but i just need to point out he wasn't a baby in the lord he'd had 25 years of walking with the lord now god called him out at age of 75 and he's almost 100 when he's going to have the birth of his son so we know it's about 25 years it's not that he was young in the Lord. So that tells all of us who have a long walk with the Lord, don't get full of yourself. Don't think, well, I won't fall because I can almost guarantee you if you think there's an area, well, surely I wouldn't do that. Look at Peter. Oh, yeah. I'll never deny you, Lord. And the next thing he knew is he had denied him three times and he was so heartbroken it almost destroyed him. It wasn't his heart intent. It wasn't what he wanted to do. But in the moment of fear, he did what he thought he'd never do. So just, just caution and just wisdom to learn. But what I see that God has done is because of what you said earlier, Dora. Abraham didn't learn the lesson. He didn't grow from the, where he should have in chapter 12. So when we don't learn the lesson God's trying to teach us, <laughs> look out. 
is going to bring you back through that lesson, back through that same test. It's the same way that your teacher in school says, you got an F, you have to retake the test, <laughs> okay? So, Abraham failed in chapter 12. God's grace got him through it. But God knows Abraham needs to grow in this area. He needs to develop his, his walk in this area. So God allows Abraham to go back into the same test. And here we go. He's down here. He's got a foreign king, ruler, you know, a bin like whatever you want to call him. And he's going to allow Abraham to see he's weak again. Abraham, when you went down into Egypt and you feared and God took care of you, now you've gone down into Gerar, it's a foreign king. Are you going to make that same mistake or are you going to trust the Lord? He is with you. He will take care of you. He will take care of the situation. He's not going to allow you to be killed off because uh, they're, they're wanting to take your wife. But does he trust in the Lord? Well, no. we know from the story he does not. He gets Sarada to lie again to say you're, that she's... Um, just his sister, and uh, um, I'm looking to see if I told you everything. Let me give you one more example. I think I did, but Deuteronomy 8 and verse 2. Do, whoops, I'm on tablet. Deuteronomy, okay, my tablet and I are not getting along. Literally. Thank you. Okay, sorry. Deuteronomy, Davarim, chapter 8 and verse 2. Our children of Israel, here's another lesson. In chapter 8 and verse 2 of, of Deuteronomy, Gavari, you shall remember all the way which the Lord your God has led you in the wilderness these 40 years, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. Now, is that verse telling us that God wanted to know if they would keep his commandments or not? <laughs> and I hope I'm seeing a lot of heads shaking. No. God knew. God knows everything. There is no surprise for God, and there's nothing that gets unveiled. God's made the whole plan. He knows the end, and he knows every second in between. So what that's saying is he allowed the children of Israel that 40 years of wandering in the wilderness to find out what's in their own hearts. Are they going to be faithful to God? The generation that was not faithful, that feared and said, we can't go into the land. There's giants in the land. Really? God who created the entire world? A giant's too big for God? But they feared and they paid the consequences. They shrunk back and God says, okay, you're, you're not going to get the promised land. You're not going to go in the land flowing with milk and honey. You're going to wander in the wilderness till your carcasses die in that wilderness. They're, they're dead, laying dead. And the young generation that's coming up, I won't punish them because of you. I'll break them in. So in that 40 years, the children of Israel are finding out that, that whole time that they didn't trust the Lord. They shrunk back. They didn't have faith in the Lord. And that they paid the consequence of not getting to go to the promised land. Now Abraham is learning what's in his heart. God knew he was going to trip here, but God didn't take him, take it away from him. He allows him to go into it, to trip in it, so that he will learn to turn to God and to cling. The same way I see a little toddler learning to walk. And if mommy and daddy say, oh, I'm going to carry you, I'm going to carry you everywhere because I don't want you to trip. Well, what would happen to that toddler? The legs would never develop, and pretty soon as that body develops, they're not going to even be able to carry that one. Can you imagine a mom and dad carrying a 40-year-old baby? <laughs> because they never let them down and never let their feet touch the ground and never let them trip and, and you know, have the funeral tears. But who was there, you know, and who helped? And how many times did mom and dad reach out and if they could keep them from stumbling? I've seen toddlers continually that are floundering and mom and dad catch up. This is what God is doing with Abraham. I'm letting you walk to see you need to hold on to my hand. You need my strength. You need my power. And Abraham hopefully is going to learn it well this time because this is his second time through. So um, why is this so serious? Let's think about that for a moment. It's, it, yes, he's developing the walk with Abraham, which we should all take very seriously. But who is Sarah? 
Sarah is the mother, the womb of the promised line to Messiah. God has made a huge promise that he is going to produce seed in Sarah. It's not the immaculate conception of Yeshua himself that happens with Miriam many years later, but it was a miraculous birth. You got a nine-year-old dried up woman and you got a hundred-year-old dried up man, and they're going to come together and suddenly she's going to be able to get pregnant. You know, this was a huge promise. And now where's Abraham sent her? She's in the midst of the foreigners. She's not where she should be. So Abraham's really giving up. Um, he's giving up the depository of all the promises. Everything that's promised is going to come out of that womb. And he's basically giving it away. He's everything that's been promised him to be a great nation and to be the line that leads to the Messiah. He's giving it up. He's walking away from it. He's, he's, I don't think you realize it. He's playing with something so critically important, so amazing of a promise. <clears throat> you want to say, where was your head, Abraham? But yet remember fear and fear makes wise men stupid. Okay, sorry, <laughs> sorry. Hey, I, and I am not putting myself up above Abraham, believe me. Chapter 17 and verse 19 of Genesis says that God said, No, but Sarah, your wife, will bear you a son. You shall call his name Yitzhak, Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. Wow, what a verse, what a promise. Abraham, where are you in this? Are you forgetting that? Sarah, your wife, will bear you a son. It's going to be Isaac. He even gives him the name of his son. They didn't spend nine months trying to figure out what to name their child. They knew what he was going to be named, and they didn't wonder for nine months whether Sarah had a boy or a girl in her womb. They knew it was a male child. He was to be named Isaac, and he was going to have the covenant of almighty everlasting God on him, with him, through him, so that it would be for all his descendants after him. That's, that's everything, folks. That's everything. That was Abraham's richest treasure. I don't care how many sheep he had. I don't care how many goats he had. I don't care how many whatever he had. This was a priceless treasure. This was his most valued possession. This was the most critical. We're dealing with a covenant with God and the promise of God. And that's why I think, you know, the God did not take this lightly with Abraham and why it's so important to realize how far he got in his mind away from God to be able to play with, with that promise in that way, to jeopardize it. Let me put it that way to jeopardize it. That should have been the, the thing he he protected the very most. I mean, hide her away or something else, I don't know, but, but again, God's allowing him to see what's in his heart and he is allowing him to go through this time, but God. Remember we started with that? But God. God's not gonna let the plan get ruined. He's not going to have to come up with plan B He's not going to have to change something. He knew what was going to take place, and he's already ahead of it. Yes. It's like the king, when he had that a vision, he must have heard about the God of, of the Bible. Have you read ahead? Uh, because they, you're telling on me. <laughs> she had right on track. She's saying this Abimelech must have known something. Yes. Yes, we'll bring that out clearly. Let's get right back to the scripture and we'll see. By the way, let me bring out one last and then we'll get right back there. We see Yeshua Jesus in his humanness and he goes into times of testing. Now, obviously, that was not to test his heart to find out what was in his heart. But look at what happens when he was tested. He came out shining. He came out the opposite of Abraham. He came out, you know, you, you saw all the more. Every time Satan came at him, you saw his purity, his righteousness, his glory. You saw who he was. The stress of his circumstances revealed the perfection of who Yeshua Jesus was. 
the stress of Abraham's circumstances showed the humanness of Abraham, humanness only. See, Yeshua is fully human, but he was fully divine. And in that, wow, what a difference. And really this attests to us how well we can trust scripture to be true. If this was a fairy tale, if this was someone just writing a story and Abraham is like a hero to us, a spiritual hero, they're not going to paint him in this bad light. They're going to paint him good. But here we've got the, you know, God hangs a wander out on the line for all to see. The good, the bad, the ugly, the indifferent. And through it, he shows his faithful hand. So in verse 3, when God said to, to Abimelech in that dream that you're a dead man, our Hebrew, the, the, the tense really is, you're about to die. So uh, Abimelech, you're being warned. <laughs> Your life's about to come to an end. Well, Abimelech did have something in mind. It, it, he did know something. Verse 4 says, now he had not come near her. And he said, Lord, notice he calls him Lord, okay? He, he refers to him as master. That means he was saying, I'm servant, your master. He acknowledged headship of the, the one who's speaking to him over him. And uh, I see Abraham call him Lord also when Abraham pleaded for uh, Sodom, when he said in, in chapter 18, you know, if there's 50, if there's 40, if, if there's any righteous, won't you spare them? Well, Abimelech, we're going to see him pretty much do the same thing because here he acknowledges him as Lord, and then he says, will you kill a nation, even though it's blameless? As if he's saying, wait a minute, I've heard about you. You don't do that. You, you didn't, you took the righteous out of Sodom, and then you destroyed it. In making an innocent mistake, are you going to not be who you are? So he had to have heard the reputation. He had to have known. And maybe he even heard of what had happened in Egypt and how God had stopped, you know, that. I don't know how much he knew. But he had a fear of God, a, a righteous fear of God. And he knew that it was within God's power to destroy. He didn't say, oh, who do you think you are? No, he knew my life is on the line and out of my people. And so he starts, you know, but wait a minute. I've heard about you. I've heard you're a righteous God. I've heard you won't t take it out on innocent people. And actually our, our Hebrew here calls it, it a righteous nation or a Gentile nation. You'll hear the word goy in our uh, vocabulary today. So he's saying, you know, we, I know we're not of your nation. But the same way you didn't go after Saddam when you had righteous people in it, won't you spare here also? So he did. He had some knowledge, Loretta, I fully believe. He knew something, and he showed him great respect. And so he goes on talking to God. He says, you know, I, I, that's not who I heard you were. I heard you don't do things like that. And hey, verse 5, did he, Abraham himself, not say to me, she is my sister? And she herself said, he is my brother. So he's saying, hey, I can call two witnesses here, Abraham and Sarah. They both said it. How was I to know? You know, I took it at face value exactly what was said. Um, and so he says, the innocence of my hand, in the innocence of my hands, I have done this. If they had spoken truth, I wouldn't have taken her. But I thought she's, you know, just a sister. I thought this was, I'll use my word, kosher. So verse 6, then God said to him in the dream. So this conversation is taking place in, um, in his dream. And I'm going to make a point about that moment too also. Yes, God speaking. I know that in the integrity of your heart you've done this. And I have also kept you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. Very interesting. God said, yes, you are, you have integrity. And you wouldn't have done this had you known. That's why I'm talking to you. I kept you from having relations with Sarah. If you had done that, you would be dead. But I kept you from that. I spared you from that. But notice how all this is taking place in a dream, in a mind of a man that we don't know to be a righteous man. 
obviously he had a respect to God. He, he, you know, and I think through this came to know more about God. And I have no idea how much of a relationship he entered into with God. But what I see is that God is in absolute control. If you're praying about something and you think to yourself, well, this one is a, a Christian. So I know this one has a relationship with God. So I know God can get through to their heart. But this one, this is a depraved, unsaved, they, they don't have any kind of moral standard or anything. How's God going to do it? Well, hello? <laughs> God had no problem talking to one who was not of the, the, what, well, the race that he was working with, the, the family of God, I'll put it that way. I'm trying to think how to say it. But the spiritual line. Avimelech was not of the spiritual line. And yet God knew how to speak to him, reveal himself to him, and knew that this one would bow to him and say, hey, I wouldn't have done it, and I'm pleading for your mercy because this was innocent on my part. And God's saying, I kept you safe. Now it's up to you what you do now. I didn't let you touch her. But if you, in essence, he's saying, if you do, you're dead. <laughs> then, again, there. then again, if they have heard about what had happened to you, and, and, I mean, you know how the work through. Exactly. Said, oh, I don't want none of that. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Word did travel. You know, we see that continually. We think that they lived back in the dark ages, and how did they find out? But how did Rahab, Rahab, know when they were coming to Jericho to to, um, to do battle in Jericho? It was the first city. How did they know? She said, "We've heard about your God." You know what? What could they have heard? They must have heard about the parting of the Red Sea and the drowning of the Egyptian army. And they're smart enough to say, hey, that God's got power. I want to be okay with that God. Spare me, God. And, and God does. He, he wasn't a respecter of persons. He never said it's just for Abraham, Abraham's family. He did say, I will bring Messiah through that family, but he died for the world. And so he gives this one a chance to... Uh, not not make it worse and do what is right. Uh, and and I just see, you know, he was a pagan king. I'll put it that way. He was not a godly king. He didn't know this God personally, but God worked in him and in his circumstances. Look with me at Proverbs 21 and 1. I should just always look at my notes and go to the scripture verses because they speak better than I do. 21 verse 1 of the book of Proverbs, and it says, the king's heart is like channels of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he wishes. So he can take a king and he can turn him toward himself like he's doing with Athimelech here. And he can rise up leaders like Pharaoh in Egypt who hardened his heart, who finally receives the judgment that finally releases the children of Israel. And that was the death of his firstborn. That was huge, but God warned and warned and warned before God took that judgment upon Pharaoh. That God knows those hearts of those kings. He raises up kings and he brings them down, some for good, some for evil. God is working in it all because even in the evil, God is working it for the good of those who are his people. So God's protective power can even pr protect us in the midst of an evil king. Now you take that and go with the, how you want with that right between those lines and I will leave that alone because I'm not about to enter into a political fracas here. <laughs> so we are still in verse six where now he said, I restrained you, I kept you from her. God was keeping his promise intact and he would do whatever was necessary to keep that promise from being destroyed or being hindered. It was going to be fulfilled. If God had not intervened, if uh, Abimelech had had a relation with Sarah, then we would never know the offspring that came out of her womb, whether it was Abraham's son or whether it was Abimelech's son. It would contaminate that line that was to lead the Messiah because it would not be who God designated. But it, it would always, I, I mean, look at all the doubters now that want to doubt about who Jesus is. They would take that and play it to the hill. Well, you don't even know who said that really was. But God didn't give any room for any kind of doubt. He was not about to leave the line for the Messiah 
up to man's mistake. He was going to protect it, and he did protect it. And he basically told Abimelech that he was about to sin against God. That's how he put it. Where is it? Uh, I'm looking for it again. Um, maybe it's what's coming up. Yeah, yeah, it, it was in verse 6, we did read it, that in the integrity of your heart, you've done this, I kept you from sinning against me. Not sin, he didn't say sinning against Abraham, he said kept you from sinning against me. And our sins really are against God. They are, when we don't keep his statutes, his commandments, his laws, his rules, we really are coming against God. Even if it is a civil law of our land, we're being disobedient, it really is actually behind it all. It is against God. And here it would have affected the Hebrew race. Remember, they're not called Jews yet, but they are called Hebrews because Abraham crossed over, and that's what Hebrew means, crossed over from that line of idolatry to worship the one true and living God. And so, again, God's going to protect the Hebrew race, the Hebrew line. He protects it all the way down through Messiah. And as we said earlier, I know he has protected this line all the way down to who will be the 144,000 in the tribulation period. When God says 12,000 of them are from the tribe of Judah, 12,000 of them are from the line of Judah. And Asher and Naphtali and every one of those sects, they're still represented somewhere in our Jewish people to this day. God does know, and he keeps his word. So he kept the king from sinning against him. He told him that you would have been sinning against me. Um, so I didn't let you touch her. Now, verse 7, then return the man's wife, for he is a prophet, and he will pray for you, and you will live. Remember, God sentenced him to death. You're about to die. That's it. Death is coming to you. But return her He's a prophet. He'll pray for you. You'll live. But if you do not return her, know that you will certainly die, you and all who are yours. So the sentence is going to fall down on his whole household. They're going to be wiped out if he does not, in obedience, return Sarah to Abraham. And in my words, immediately. You know, don't, don't think about this for a month. You just better get your act in gear. Get this one out of your house. Send her back where she belongs. And he will pray for you, and you will live. This is the first time that we have the word prophet in Scripture. Now, in this case, it's not meaning that Abraham's going to predict the future, but a prophet not only foretells when they tell something that's going to happen in the future, and we have the prophets all through the Scriptures, but they're also one who foretells. When you're foretelling, you are speaking the word of God. Abraham would be a fourth teller. He would be speaking the word of God as God inspired him. And he would, in this case, he's not going to say, well, you know, 100 years from now, this is going to happen. But he is going to say, speaking for God, your life will be spared, Abimelech. I have prayed for you not to suffer the consequence of my sin. And that's what, what we're seeing here. Um, God had not forsaken Abraham. He calls Abraham, and at this moment of time where Abraham is in sin, he's still calling him his prophet. He's still my mouthpiece for God. He, he's not pulling back from Abraham. God never does. His gifts and his calling, we are told, are without, uh, oh, what's the word? God doesn't draw them back. There's a word for that. He doesn't, um, the only word I can think of is not the word I want, but renege on a promise, because um, that's a bad word. He doesn't, let me see if it's in my scriptures here. Um, I, it might be. Let's, let's look as we need to anyway at Romans eleven twenty nine, and if it doesn't give me the word, I likely will think of it in a moment, what I'm trying to say. Um, it, what I'm saying is God doesn't change his mind. He doesn't give you a gift one day and yank it back the next day. God is faithful, and uh, he does what he does because of who he is, not because we earn it. But, yeah, here we go, irrevocable. That's my word. See, I need to always go to the word of God. Romans eleven twenty nine says, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Anyone have an irrevocable trust? That means it cannot be changed. It can't be pulled back. It can't. A revocable you can make changes to. God is saying, my gifts 
my calling, if I've gifted you, if I've called you, I don't pull those back. They're irrevocable. You didn't earn it. You can't demerit it either. You can't have it taken from you. That's God's grace. That's his mercy to us to, to allow us to make a mistake like Abraham's making here and still leave us with that blessing from him, bring correction, make it what it ought to be, but not say, I'm done with you. You know, you blew it. I gave you a chance and you blew it. We hear that in the human world all the time. Well, I gave you a chance. I'm not giving you a second chance. God's a God of second chances. Don't take advantage of that, but he is. <laughs> and verse uh, 13 of, of 2 Timothy 2. 2 Timothy 2, verse 13 says, If we are faithless, right now Abraham was faithless. His faith shook, he got scared, and he knee-jerked. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. He is who he is. He is the faithful God. He is the one true and faithful God. He is faithful yesterday. He is faithful today. And he is faithful tomorrow. That's why when someone asks me, well, what if we really, if we as Christians really got our, on our knees and really prayed, and we prayed for, for Israel to turn from her wicked ways before the tribulation starts, couldn't the Lord come back? Couldn't we be spared the tribulation? and the millennium be brought in and the tribulation never happened. And my answer to that is no, it cannot happen because God has prophetically said this will happen. It's not going to change. We can pray for people to be spared from it, but overall that judgment is going to fall on this earth no matter what, because what God says he does, he is faithful. He does not change. He does not you know, there's no variableness, no changing with him. And that's our security. That's where we can put our faith in him. I will warn you, don't look to another human because you, that you may love them. You may have 60 years with them. You may have a great relationship with them. But I guarantee you there's going to be a moment here or there that, that you're going to feel let down or disappointed or hurt or whatever. That's human nature. Even unintentional, they'll hurt you or let you down or, or change. Or maybe you do see somebody who you've known for 60 years, and when they were in their 20s, they were this way. Now that they're in their 60s, they, they've warped in a whole different person as far as you're concerned. If we had a God like that, that would give us a right to fear. That would give us I hope he's going to be okay. I hope he's not going to decide to get that club out. You know, we don't live like that. We know his grace and his mercy are constant. His mercy is new every morning. Come to the throne of grace. Come boldly and ask that you will receive in your time of need. He never changes. He is faithful. If he's made a promise, take it all the way to the bank. And don't stand at the bank door and say, I wonder if this check is good. Go in, put it down at the teller, cash it, pull that cash out, and use it. God gave you that promise for a reason. So all the way, hook, line, and sinker. The same God that was faithful to Abraham is the same God who is faithful to us. Never fails. Never. Now, obviously, in this culture at this time, Adultery was looked upon as so bad that it was a capital offense. Even God saying, you, if you have a relationship with her, that's adultery, and you're going to die. But even when he is given a harsh law, and I don't mean harsh as in unfair, I just mean, well, you know, this, this is the law. You commit adultery, the consequence is death. Even in that, you still see God didn't change. God didn't say one day, that's not okay. The next day, it is okay. God stays the same. His forgiveness is always available. And we can, thankfully, go to him, confess, go to him with a heart full of fear and say, Lord, I'm fearful. Take, my, take this fear from me. And hear the verse that says, perfect love casts out all fear. Where do you find perfect love? Who loves you perfectly? God and God alone. Cast all your care on him, for 
where he cares for you. What lessons we learn from Abraham in this chapter today. I mean, this, this is huge. I think it's why God let it be written because it's an embarrassment for Abraham. But thankfully, Abraham, thank you for allowing, well, Abraham didn't allow, but God, thank you for putting it into scripture because how many of us need that encouragement today? We know we haven't lived perfectly. You may be struggling right now with something that you know you haven't done right before the Lord. And so often I hear, especially in the unsaved, I'll hear, you know, well, the Lord can't forgive that. Or someone feels like, well, I blew it. I had a chance to serve him. Now it's over. No, 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 no. God wasn't done with Abraham. Calls him a prophet when he's acting in fear. It puts the word of God in his mouth, and let's see what happens, okay? Because he said he'll pray for you. God was not going to allow Abimelech to put the sin on Abraham's account. He's not going to say, Abraham's going to die because he made the mistake. God's not going to justify one and condemn the other on the basis of that. Our justification, our basis of righteousness comes to one on one us with the Lord, only through the Lord. God is the judge. He is the judge of his people. He is the fair judge. And I think so often, I am so thankful God is the judge because we as humans think we know someone else and we do not know their heart. They can put on a front that can make them look wonderful and they can be the whitewashed sepulchers with dead men's bones inside of them, and it can be the vice versa also. They can, because they're not living it well, they can be pretty ornery and look pretty bad, and yet God sees their heart. I'll take you as I'm going to Romans 8, 33 and 34. I'll take you through the life of David. God calls David a man after God's own heart. You can go to Romans 8. Chapter, Romans 8. Romans 8. Uh -huh. Verse 33 and 34. David's a man after God's own heart. And you could say, really? David, he is? But God, he committed murder. He had Uzziah put to death so he could have his wife. He committed adultery. He committed murder. You can't say he's, got, uh, he's after your heart. But God did see his heart. Yes, David paid a high consequence. He, there was a penalty to be paid. Every time we make mistakes, there are penalties. Okay, sorry folks. Shadow, shadow is okay. Way to delivery under the, the door. Sorry folks. I hope your nerves are back in your body. <laughs> in spite of our mistakes, God does judge the heart. Like I said, there's consequences for our actions. That God did not throw Abraham because Abraham made this mistake and acted in fear. He didn't throw David out because David acted in the flesh and did mistakes that he made. Romans 8, 33 and 34 says, Who will bring a charge against God's elect? Okay, before we go on, who's God's elect? The elect are those who God saved. So we are the elect. We are those who are of God. We are the elect. God is the one who justifies. So he's basically saying, your neighbor can call you out. Satan can call you out. Satan can go right up to the throne room and he can get in. in he, get, we can make it a courtroom. God's a judge. And Satan can say, Oh, I know this one. I know Rochelle. She did this and she did that. She's not worthy. You know, she's got all these and she's still doing them. And God says, you can't bring a charge against her. She's mine. She's my elect. She's been washed in the blood. Those sins are gone. You take a hike. She stays with me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So God is the one. He's the one who come, you know, and straighten us out. And how do we know that? Uh, well, let's keep reading. Verse thirty-three was ended with God is the one who justifies. Who is the one? Who I'm sorry. Who is the one who condemns? Messiah Yeshua, Christ Jesus, is he who died? Yes, rather he who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. So let me take you back to that courtroom. Let me take you back to God being the judge. 
let me take you to that, that lawyer that's just come up to the bench and has said, here's the list of sins, and it's a mile long on this one, God. And before I even want to open my mouth and try to defend myself, and how can I when I know he's got the goods on me? I did these things. This one who we see here uses the word intercede, intercedes for me. Yeshua Jesus jumps between Satan and God and says, wait a minute, Dad, this one's in my blood. This one's been forgiven. This one, we can't see those sins. They're gone. They're forgotten. They're washed away forever. And God says, free, no judgment. This one comes into my presence. Hallelujah. That's our God. He is the one who justifies. He is the one who judges. Yeshua Jesus is interceding for us even now. And again, I will tell you, do not take advantage. There are consequences. <laughs> but rest in the peace of knowing nothing can take you out of the hand of God. Nothing can take your salvation from you. You can't even do that to yourself because you didn't put yourself in there, so you can't take yourself out. And I love the fact that, that we are told that we're in the hand I see that nail print, I see the etching, I see our name there. The Lord closes his hand around us and we're secure. It's the most secure place on the whole body. Try getting something out of somebody's hand, even a little three-year-old. Try peeling open those fingers and you know how hard it is. But in John 10, it's not only the hand of Yeshua, but then it's the hand of God over that hand also. That's double security. And someone once said, it's not me, but I like it and I'll use it. Don't be, the, the only thing you could do is you could try to jump. And all you manage to do is jump from a knuckle to a knuckle, but you can't get out from the hand. So don't be a knucklehead. <laughs> Stay in the safety and be obedient to the Lord. So before I get too wordy, because I know I'm preaching to the choir, but we all need this encouragement. Because I guarantee you, as Satan is not troubling you today and saying, you're worthless. You just, look at what you just did. Look at that thought you thought. And by the way, who gives you that thought and then blames you for that thought? But, you know, he's a piece of work. So um, I, I know I'm preaching hard, but we all need to be built back up because we all go through these same tests. So we're back in, I think we are ready for verse 8. Yes. Yeah, if you don't return her, you will die. But go return her. He's a prophet. He's got the word of God in him. He will pray for you and you will live. Verse 8. So Abimelech got up early in the morning. <laughs> I have a feeling he got up shortly after the dream ended. I think sleep for the night was over. I think he could wait for the morning to begin and get up and start taking action. That shows where he was at. He is not going to allow time. He's not going to allow half a day to go by early in the morning, calls his servants and told all these things in their presence. And the people were greatly frightened. What did he tell them? He told them, God, the, the God of Abraham came to me in a dream, told me Sarah is his wife. And if I don't give her back, I'm a dead man. And it's not just me. It's all that belongs to me. That's all of you guys. Yeah, they're afraid. Who is this God? And what's going to happen? And what are you going to do? Because now their lives are in his hands. If he says, I'm going to defy that God. I want you to put on armor. We're going to fight this out. If he, you know, he could have had whatever attitude. They would pay the consequences of it. So, yes, that put them into fear. I didn't know that. That it was, it's going to affect all of them. I thought it was just really big. That God said in that dream, He said, You will certainly die, you and all who are yours, all that belong to you. There are times our actions, the consequences fall on yeah. those around us, those we love. And we need to realize that I don't want my family hurting because I do something foolish and I pay the consequence and they hurt. And we see that. We see many a time in scripture where the, there were others who fell under those consequences, just like in, in any situation today, we see this isn't a fair world. I'm not saying God wasn't fair, but our world isn't. And there are those who get away with murder, and the, there are those who suffer consequences, you know, that, that 
somebody else did something, but it fell on them. You know, you hear, when you were children in a classroom, the whole classroom would get in trouble sometimes because you couldn't seek out the individual, so it came down on them all. When rain falls, it falls on all. I'll just say to you, when God's giving you an umbrella protection, stay under it. If you get wet, Whose fault is it? Who came out from under the umbrella of God's protection? Okay, yeah. okay so the, the servants, the, the family members are all, you know, they're, they're frightened now. But Avimelech is a man on the move. He's a man of action. and He's taking action. So he's told the household what's going on. He's told about the dream. Now, verse 9, uh, he calls Avraham. And he says to him, he chastises Avraham. Okay, this is a, a heathen king, a heathen royal leader, whatever you want to say, who is now chastising the man of God. Very interesting. And sometimes it is the world that pulls us up short. Sometimes we do hear the world say, well, I would have expected that out of, you know, one of these, but you're supposed to be different. And that's a horrible moment for a, a Christian to feel, you know, to be reproached by the world. Uh, that's Wow, we just don't want to go there. Avimelech has called Abraham publicly. It's in the presence of his servants, and he probably is doing that to justify himself as well as shame Abraham, because he does. What have you done to us? Notice he didn't say to me. The whole household stands to suffer from this. What have you done to us? And how have I sinned against you? that you have brought on me and my kingdom a great sin. You have done to me things that ought not to be done. I sin with his finger in Abraham's face and rightfully so, you know, you are being called out. And here comes Abraham's excuse, but I'll tell you right up front, it's a flimsy excuse. As soon as he calls Abraham on the carpet, Abraham says in verse 11, well, because I thought surely there's no fear of God in this place and they will kill me because of my wife. And then he gives excuse, you know, she's actually my sister, the daughter of my father, not my mother, and, and then she became my wife. That was a, a half-truth, though. Yes, she was his half-sister, but she also was his wife. And anytime when you tell a half-truth to give a false picture, it's a whole lie. It's not a half lie, it's a whole lie, okay? So if you're intending to deceive, oh, well, I'll just, I'll sugarcoat it. I'll have a little bit of the truth in there, but I'll bring in a little bit of a lie. No, the whole thing is called out. And here again, all we're seeing is his lack of God's protective, lack of trust in God's protective care. And so this is where I'm saying that I believe that he got his eyes off the Lord it's where he was outside of God's will, maybe even. Maybe God didn't want him to go down to Gerard. We don't know what, if he had conversation with God. Did he ask God? Or did he do what I hear too many do today? Here's my plans, Lord. Bless them. Instead of, what do you want me to do, Lord? Or ask. Yes, we need to ask first. We need to bring our plans. Lord, do you want me to do this? Instead of coming up and thinking, okay, I want to do this and I want to do that. Now, Lord, bless my plans. What if it's not God's will? And again, Scripture doesn't tell us what Abraham did, but I believe at the very least he got his eyes off the Lord because anytime we have fear, we're not looking at the Lord and we're not walking in the, the presence of the Lord. So at the very least that, and at the most he might have, he might have not, he might have just run ahead of the Lord, not intentionally, but without being careful to stop and ask. He just decided, hey, I don't want to live here anymore. I don't want to live seeing what happened here. I don't want that devastation. Uh, yeah, I'm just going to uproot and I'm going to move. We, we don't know, but I bring these out so that whatever position we're in, we need to learn, ask before you take actions. Ask the Lord, is this your will? Is this your direction? Is this what you want me to do? And when you have that green light from the Lord, then move forward. And I will tell you, when in doubt, don't. Because God will make his way clear. He will, he will let you know. It may not be immediate. You may have to wait on the Lord. God's timing is perfect. But I guarantee you, God won't leave you up to chance. He's not, not going to leave you guessing. How many times have I said in this, 
he didn't leave it to chance. He didn't leave it to them to guess. He didn't leave it for us to try to figure it out. No, he spells it out. And I guarantee you, he will not fail you. So, Abraham, your excuse, you're the man who should be showing to Abimelech the strength in the Lord, not fear. You know, the, the, the problem wasn't, the problem wasn't the fear of God lacking, like Abraham said in verse 11. You know, because I thought surely there's no fear of God in this place. That wasn't the problem, that there wasn't fear of God in the place of Gerar. The problem was Abraham wasn't walking in the fear of God, putting him first, listening to him, following him. So he's gotten himself a little sideways at the very least, and God had to bring that correction. So he, he makes this excuse, and he says in verse 13, and it came about when God caused me to wander from my father's house that I said to her, and I'm going to say again, oops, do we know that? Did God cause you to wonder, wander, not wonder, but wander, W-A-N-D-E-R. The Hebrew word is, there's many words that can be translated wander. They can have the idea like of an animal going astray, a drunken man that's reeling and staggering. It can be a sinful seduction that's leading one astray, a prophet's lies that causes the people to err because we know there were false prophets, a path to lying heart. All these scriptures will use the words, different words that can mean wonder. But the one used here was very, very strong in, in this. Um, it was used in the worst way. So now Abraham's not only said, I fear you wouldn't have the fear of God here, but now he's also, in essence, almost blaming God. God caused me to wander. You know, God caused me to be led astray. Really? You want to go there, Abraham? I don't think so. If you shouldn't have been in Gerar, you got there by your own doing, not by God leading you. Now, if God did lead him to Gerar, then God led him there to be tested to see what's in his heart for his spiritual growth. So I'm not saying that God didn't lead him. But I'm saying the way Abraham phrased it, it's almost like when Adam said to God, well, you're the one who gave me the wife. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it's that human nature in us. We want to pass the buck on to somebody else. So verse 13, you know, that when God caused me to wander from my father's house, and that's taking it all the way back to Ur the Chaldees when he left. And all this time, 25 years, it's like, well, it got started because God caused me to wander. Well, I think you're glad God brought you out to come into this land. Um, and I lost my place. Okay, then I said to her, said to Sarah, this is the kindness with which I can't speak. Sorry, this is the kindness which you will show to me everywhere we go. Say of me, he is my brother. So that does give me the idea that when they first set out on the journey, Abraham probably was saying, you know, wifey, I don't know where we're going. I don't know who we're going to rub shoulders with. I don't know what those people are going to be like. We're the ones that know the one true and living God. We're leaving behind idolatry, but they're, they're healing out there. They don't know God, and you are one beautiful lady. <laughs> and I am afraid, you know, they're, they're going to go after you. So it, I think it was his thought process when he was very, very young in the Lord that his growth should have taken him away from that. His growth shouldn't have, uh, should have kept him from falling back on that old way of being. But it just shows us, as long as we're in our human bodies, the flesh is going to have its issues, and there are going to be those moments of weakness. That's why we've got to not feed the flesh, and we've got to feed the spirit. When we walk in the spirit, we won't sin. When we walk in the flesh, it's a guaranteed result. That's just... It's just the facts, and we just all need to realize, crucify that flesh, lay it down, make yourself that willing sacrifice that allows the Lord carte blanche. Don't rest on your laurels and think, well, I made it through that test, I'm in good shape. No, because another one's coming, and you need God's hand fresh and new, and, you know, you just, I've said it, I've said it. I'm getting too, oh, my word, I am too wordy. Look at the time. Let me get us to a stopping point. Um, I think I've made clearly it was due to his feebleness of his faith. You know, he was trusting God with the eternal. 
Why couldn't he trust God in regard to his temporal things? He's going down because, you know, maybe it was better land now. They didn't have the good land, the fertile land. Who knows? But we need to trust God in everything, every little everyday need. God is faithful and able, and he can meet us in those needs because he is a God who is the possessor of heaven and earth. He wasn't lacking anything. Why did Abraham go? We don't know. But God has told us he is our shield. He's our great reward. He is the supplier of all our needs. And whenever we act out in fear or even just our lives are in fear in our minds, we need to ask the Lord forgiveness because he's given us no right. And here at this point, it would have been really good if Abraham would have said, you know what, Avinel, you are right. You have called me out. I was wrong. My God, he is the rock of my salvation. He is the possessor of heaven and earth. I've seen what he did when, when I went after, in battle after my nephew Lot. I've, you know, He could have rehearsed this whole history of all the things God has done for him and said, look, you know, in sinning against my God, I sinned against you. Forgive me. That would have been a good attitude if he had, but instead he's making these excuses that, well, it's this way, this, you know, and that's our human nature. We want to make excuses, but in this case, it would have been better. Let's look at the results real quickly. Uh, Abimelech then took sheep and uh, oxen, male and female servants, gave them to Abraham and returned his wife, Sarah, to him. So Abraham gets Sarah back, but he also gets, uh, uh, he gets blessed by Abimelech. And I think it was Abimelech's respect to Abraham's God that he wanted to, to move in that way and even, even give more than what was required of him at this point. This is such a contrast to Pharaoh that we'll see, well, even the Pharaoh in chapter 12. I'm realizing there's a little too much in here to try to explain because I've got to get into some of the Hebrew background for you to understand what was given to Sarah and what the words are meaning about her. So rather than try to jam it in two minutes and confuse you all, I'm going to tell you, come back and find out what Abraham and Sarah walked away with. Why and, and what, and, and what does this mean, and what can we learn from that also. So we'll pick that up next time. When we uh, get back together, we'll pick up with, um, we'll probably start right here at verse 14 with what Abimelech gives to Abraham and uh, where, where it all ends. Um, and we'll see, and because you, if you miss next week, I just want to make sure I bring it out very, very strongly. Sarah was not touched. There was no compromise of her womb. There is no doubt who Papa is when Yitzhak is born. God didn't leave it for a chance. He didn't allow anything to compromise. It was fully protected because God is faithful. So I just have to say that because we'll get into a little bit of that as we move forward. Um, and then we get into the happiness because uh, anyone remember what Yitzhak, what Isaac means? Laughter. Laughter. Joy is going to fill the house. Where if we get past our mistakes, blessings do come. Okay, questions, comments? Oh, okay. All right, then forgive me for going over. I have really gone over, but I lost track of time like usual. <laughs> um, and I uh, hope you'll be excited to come back and find out why did Avi Mel give what he gave and what does it mean to the, these two? And, uh, and let's hopefully get into our happier chapter also next. Okay, we'll close in a word of prayer and then we'll open the mics again. Lord God, how we do thank you for your faithfulness, that you are faithful to every word, to every promise, and that you will fulfill in your perfect timing everything that you have said you would do. Thank you that also in that um, faithfulness of who you are is wrapped up our salvation. Thank you. We have no doubt, no fear. We cannot unsave ourselves. Thank you that we can walk in the security of that. But Lord, may we not take it for granted and may we not use it for an excuse, but may we use it to motivate us to fully please you, to serve you, to lay our lives down and allow you carte blanche to direct every moment of our lives. Let us learn from Abraham's example. Let us turn to you when we're fearful 
and allow you to drive out that fear with your perfect love. And thank you that you will guide us. So no matter what anyone is facing right now, whatever test they are in, whatever trial, the unspoken prayer request that did not go out today, Lord, you know. And we know that these tests do show us where we need to grow. They do show us how faithful you are. They do show us your grace and your mercy. So, Lord, may we even thank you for our trials. May we see that, that these are thorns not to be in our side to, to sidetrack us, but instead it draws closer to you because when we have a thorn, we do cry out to you. We do come closer to you. So, Lord, may it be through our, our tears that it's the rain that makes our rainbow when it's mixed with your sun shine. May we see that our thorns are really our crowns because they bring us closer and in right relationship with you and in that may we learn may we grow may we trust may we please you and may we praise you whether we see and understand or not lord may we always praise you and thank you and always always thank you for our salvation oh lord you are precious to us in the holy name of yeshua jesus amen amen